So you have probably watched or at least have seen videos titled Reject Modernity, Embrace Masculinity. They generally start by showing clips from people who eat junk food or represent some form of ideology that expresses contempt for this quote-unquote masculine lifestyle of discipline and physical exercise. This is followed by clips from Ronnie Coleman and Ziz, along with pictures of early Greek statues, strong men and even Patrick Bate. The message is clear. People from the first part of the clip are thought to symbolize cultural decadence, which is termed modernity, whereas the second half of the video supposedly rejects this unhealthy and futile lifestyle. As a response to this, it embraces suffering and hardship, which ascribes meaning and purpose to modern existence. This is termed masculinity. Now, I have heard the criticism that modern society is extremely polarized and that this type of content best shows how the pendulum swings from one cultural end to another. However, I find some disturbing and noteworthy issues with this phenomenon that need to be articulated. So, to make this as short as possible, I will first explain the basic tenets of modernity and then review the core concept of masculinity, relevant to this theme. After these two are out of the way, I will proceed to demonstrate what I find to be problematic. Generally, modernity describes the set of socio-cultural and intellectual transformations that took off during the period of the early Renaissance, extending up to the Second World War. Because there are universal characteristics of modernity that were evident right from the beginning up to the modern world, different scholars expressed a more or less similar understanding of what constitutes modernity. The work by Polish sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, The Liquid Modernity, starts with the following epigraph. Interruption, incoherence, surprise are the ordinary conditions of our life. They have even become real needs for many people whose minds are no longer fed by anything but sudden changes and constantly renewed stimuli. We can no longer bear anything that lasts. We no longer know how to make boredom bear fruit. So the whole question comes down to this. Can the human mind master what the human mind has made? First, liquefaction of solids that bound together institutions and humans with each other in a closed cultural system, where everything functioned as a whole organism, sharing one common metaphysical notion. There was no such thing as an independence of economy from the state, economy from church, church from state, a family from the village, members of the family from each other, or concepts such as a free individual as it is known today. Second, triumph of instrumental thinking and means over ends and purpose. In modernity, means always justify an end. Instrumental rationalism and technology are emancipated from the universal goals they were supposed to serve. Note that I'm using the word technology as a techne, which encompasses broader meaning than modern electronic devices. For example, verbal communication and being skilled at crafting iron, for example, is a form of technology. In the age of modernity, means and technology became valuable in and of themselves, irrespective of the subject matter and the common goal. And the third, disenchantment of the world. Now everything can be explained scientifically with the power of reason and rationality. As a result, people are emancipated from the darkness of ignorance and fear of nature, as now it can be controlled and conquered. After the Industrial Revolution, the Western world broke free from the Malthusian trap, condition when people are at odds with nature. If they didn't work for basic sustenance, death was unavoidable, as there was no surplus of goods and no guarantee that you could safely get through the year without excruciating work, especially if we are talking about middle to lower class people. Now let's briefly and simply address these three points. The heart of modernity starts with Machiavelli. You have probably heard the term Machiavellian, which denotes an approach that is very cold and pragmatic, with the notion that ends justify the means. It means that any action a person can take will be ethically justified if it serves their goal and desire that one sets in his mind. Now, the major shift that takes with Machiavelli and his works, The Prince and the Discourses on Levi, is that virtue is now understood as an instrument rather than an abstract ideal. The way Machiavelli uses the word virtue is completely different from the pre-modern understanding. Namely, now it becomes a form of social technology to pursue one's worldly and mundane power strivings, whatever those strivings are in a particular case. Now, for you to understand the gist of modernity, I want to make a distinction between a worldview that is primarily oriented towards means and instruments, and one which is concerned with ends and final causes. 
in the pre-modern world, society, as individual is not yet understood as an independent and existentially free entity, has or is destined to have a final cause, a metaphysical destination, a form of inherent end to which its members need to strive. Stoicism, with its philosophically fulfilled lifestyle, Aristotelian virtue ethics, aiming at the human flourishing or virtuous existence in conformity with human excellence, and the Christian medieval way of life, presupposes a metaphysical end goal with which you are born and for which every existing means and instruments should be utilized. The common metaphysical goal, in essence, transcends the boundary of individual well-being, as one is thought to be a good citizen and a religiously devoted person, for example. The primary shift that takes place with the advent of modernity is the loss of that final cause, the inherent inscribed function with which humans come into being. Therefore, the only thing we are left with now is empty means, empty instruments which can now serve an individual irrespective of what goal one comes up with. Thus the Sartrean formula, existence precedes essence. A worldview that emerged as a logical culmination of modernity, extending its roots deep down into the cultural fabric. Now humans are free to choose their essence, as in the modern and postmodern world, we are no longer introduced to the world with fixed meaning and purpose but rather, as Heidegger terms it, were thrown into the world. Thus, the concept of thrownness, whereby in their shellless state, human crawls on the surface of the earth, eager to find a shell to get in, and feel the psychological warmth that one lacks in the cold world of meaning crisis. Therefore, the primary purpose of modernity is human well-being, as there is nothing left other than individuals. Thus, progress becomes the guiding principle. So, if you go on and read Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, you can see through the essence of modernity. In this work, Pinker presents his main thesis, namely that humans have objectively progressed and advanced in every aspect of being, a process that took off from the advent of the Enlightenment values of reason, science and empirical inquiry, producing necessary technological means by which humans are emancipated from the shackles of dark and ignorant Middle Ages. This is a period when people could die from easily preventable health complications or be sentenced to death for robbery. A period when the average individual thought that mice were spontaneously generated in the pile of straw. Now, the reason why I chose this book as an illustration of modernity is that it is mostly concerned with technology and instruments and how they are valuable. Pinker provides empirical evidence with statistical graphs to illustrate that humans have advanced in every aspect of living, such as health, mortality, longevity, education, life expectancy, and others. However, even though Pinker criticizes late modern and postmodern thinkers, he still operates in the paradigm of means and instruments rather than ends. Let's see what he had to say to a student who asked him about the meaning of life. A student in the audience raised her hand and asked me, why should I live? The student's ingenious tone made it clear that she was neither suicidal nor sarcastic, but genuinely curious about how to find meaning and purpose if traditional religious beliefs about an immortal soul are undermined by our best science. And now let's see his answer. In the very act of asking that question, you are seeking reasons for your convictions, and so you are committed to reason as the means to discover and justify what is important to you. And there are so many reasons to live. In his answer, the words that dominate are reasons and means, rather than ends and goals. Now you are just a person who is seeking ways to justify whatever goal one comes up with. Reason becomes valuable and sacred in and of itself. This reminds me of Strauss's understanding of John Locke, where life is a joyless quest for joy, which laconically defines modernity. So the first takeaway is clear. Instrumental reasoning with the advent of Cartesian thought and the Newtonian world as a clockwork becomes the primary guiding principle, even though people are left without the common goal as a result of the death of God and the destruction of shared values. Thus Pinker, as a modern intellectual, takes reason to be enough as a substitute and an antidote for the ongoing meaning crisis that faces modern society. Now, the second takeaway which seems obvious is that although we have arrogantly rejected the naive metaphysical outlook of the pre-modern world, humans are still dissatisfied with the lack of a final cause. Maybe, after all, we don't really enjoy existential freedom that much. Maybe the freedom of coming up with one's own personal purpose is not as light and weightless as the word freedom suggests it to be. Thus, it is altogether questionable whether it can be called a freedom or not. 
Turns out that now with the existence of infinite material comfort and lack of serious existential challenges, people are asking for it, as if something inside of us yearns for a purpose for which we can sacrifice a lot and endure whatever it takes. Now you could say that modern common end goal is well-being, which is by the way never clearly defined. Although utilitarianism and modern positivist thought, such as Sam Harris's moral landscape for example, take well-being to be the primary ethical purpose, it still remains foggy and lacks the clarity and power which is necessary to unite people under a common principle. Further, the new postmodern approach to liquidity will tell you that well-being varies from person to person and it has no objective factor to it. Getting to the liquefaction part, Sigmund Bauman talks about key distinctions between solids and liquids to differentiate the essence of modernity from the pre-modern world. Solids take up space and exhibit a property of resistance to change. If you apply shear stress, it won't lose its shape and will be quick to return to its original form. And that's the key here, as solids have that essence, that final cause to which they adhere, a sort of inner homeostasis which tries not to lose its shape. Whereas fluids, on the other hand, are unable to hold their shape, as they are in essence shapeless, thus being constantly ready to take on different forms. The liquefaction of solids that took place in modernity, or which final product we are witnessing in the postmodern world, has to do with burning the bridges between solids, rather than solids themselves. According to Bauman, it's not that those solids of traditions and institutions that were a target of deconstruction and liquefaction, but rather the ties and bridges that connected them. And that's the difference between liquids and solids, as solids owe their properties to the structural bonding of the molecules within it, whereas in liquids molecules are constantly breaking and reforming their connections. To simplify, with the advent of modernity we enter into a zombie mode, where institutions are plugged off from the interdependencies. Zombie because it is alive and dead at the same time. One such institution is family, for example. Ask yourself, what actually is a family nowadays? What does it mean? Of course, there are children, my children, our children, but even parenthood, the core of family life, is beginning to disintegrate under conditions of divorce. Grandmothers and grandfathers get included and excluded without any means of participating in the decisions of their sons and daughters. From the point of view of their grandchildren, the meaning of grandparents had to be determined by individual decisions and choices. Now that the chain of being is broken, namely the connection between beings, humans are left with an open and unprotected sky. As Pascal puts it, the eternal silence of this infinite space is frightening me. Now, in this age of advanced technology and the capitalist economy of Fordism, where instruments are at their best, where humans are becoming instruments themselves as they are now understood as human resources rather than just humans, people no longer have to suffer for basic sustenance. This process of shelllessness where now people are eager to find prestigious of meaning, as it turns out that doing away with the final end goal was not that successful, is further intensified with the emergence of electronic media and modern day technology, which allows one to have a digital two-dimensional life with electronic avatars and prosthetic egos. And here we get to the content of this video and thus to the phenomenon of surrogate purposes. As now people don't have the necessity to satisfy their physical needs, they have to come up with artificial goals so that their lives can at least have the illusion of meaning. Now keep in mind that this generally happens when one is freed from basic physical limitations imposed by mother nature. For example, Emperor Hirohito, who didn't have to bother with thinking about basic sustenance, instead of ushering into hedonism, came up with a surrogate activity of marine biology, which he became quite good at. Same with kings and emperors who boasted their hunting skills, although now it was a form of art and posture rather than an attempt to acquire food, as meat for kings and aristocrats was always available and no one forced them to hunt. Now let's first briefly look at what the first part of this reject modernity embrace masculinity symbolizes and then I will present the catastrophic flaws of this new understanding of masculinity. Surely lots of people found hedonism, junk food and short-term rewards as a new surrogate activity to avoid the abyss of modern meaning crisis. Now the thing about the short-term stimuli in junk food is that they have the property of annihilating a sense of individuality, thus offering its consumers the gift of self-forgetfulness, which is extremely antidepressing. When you eat something very rewarding and tasty, at that moment there is no you. 
there is no self, as your whole individuality is reduced to that artificially generated feeling of pleasure and of that unheard release of dopamine in your reward system. That's the primary difference between junk food and regular food, between tasty and unsavory one. Think about it for a moment. When you are eating regular food or food which is disgusting, let's say, what happens is that you have more time to think about yourself, to contemplate, as the food that you are eating is not tasty enough to reduce your being to that one particular feeling of intense pleasure. In the case of bitter food, for example, the contrast between you who dislikes the food or is disgusted with it, what you are eating, and the external world is further intensified. Note that the insular cortex responsible for generating the sense of disgust is also responsible for the feeling of self and of your corporeal body. Now, this way of surrendering individuality to junk food or short-term rewards is a nice way to achieve transient self-forgetfulness. Turns out that people do not really want to look in the eyes of meaninglessness and thus forgetting oneself becomes a new technology to prevent yourself from re-experiencing the meaning crisis. Now here we come to the masculinity part. To cut right into the gist of the problem with the ethos of this clips where the part of masculinity begins, I will present three major and deadly problems which are evident in these videos and in popular understanding of modern day masculinity. First, it is overly aesthetical. And overly is a bad thing in this case because aesthetics is about balance and harmony. Second, it is overly emotional and impulsive, which is also problematic as masculinity is or should be about self-control and stoic solidity. And the third, the most devastating one, it exemplifies modernity par excellence. It is modernity in all its twisted aspects, thus it doesn't respond nor solve the problem it poses, as this understanding of masculinity operates within the paradigm of modernity. Now let's explain all of them step by step. Now first and foremost, if you are a person who has basic understanding of Jungian psychology, the thing that strikes you in the masculinity part of these videos is the re-emergence of the warrior archetype and the repressed masculine energy in its shadow and pathological state. It's as if in the cry of Ronnie Coleman when he deadlifts the barbell, you hear a collective sigh or anger of modern men, frustrated because of the repressed masculine energy. Now to make it clear, I want to understand this phenomenon, I emphasize with this, and in no shape or form do I criticize this with evil and malicious intent. Now what I'm presenting here is not a destructive critique, but rather a constructive one, as I hope that people who listen to this will be provoked to give their world feeling, which is not a worldview yet, a more philosophical dimension. Now to continue the explication of the warrior archetype, Two men who come up in the masculinity part of the video are Ronnie Coleman and Ziz. Now I think that there are key reasons of why this is the case. Apart from both being a representative of the fitness industry which predominates in these clips and which I find to be problematic, these two persons also share one additional property relevant to the ethos of the modern masculine archetype. Namely, both of them were sacrificed to something. Ronnie seriously compromised his health so that he could pursue his goals, which led to life-threatening injuries, leaving him in a very compromised state. And what Ronnie symbolizes to people who are probably invested in this content is pain and suffering. The pain and suffering that these people are searching for. Now, suffering gives life its purpose. As a matter of fact, pain is one of the key mechanisms with which one can generate a sense of catharsis and spiritual ecstasy. Thus, in these videos we have a contrast between seemingly opposing and yet similar phenomena of pleasure and pain. Similar as both of them became ways of generating surrogate activities in a world which suffers from meaning crisis, and different in the sense that both of them have their particular target audience who vary in their psychological types. Now, people whose psyche is dominated by the warrior archetype are inherently predetermined to have disciplined and orderly life. As a result, they are asking for hardship, challenge and suffering to somehow fill the void of the modern existential crisis. Thus the predominance of bodybuilding in these videos, which is a new form of a surrogate activity, which one came up to simulate a sense of purpose. Now I want you to keep in mind that I am talking about bodybuilding here, not physical hardship or the form of exercise that one needs for a practical purposes. Bodybuilding as hunting in the case of aristocrats and kings and as marine biology for Hirohito is a surrogate activity, a ready to hand surrogate activity, extremely convenient and comfortable for a warrior archetype who is unable to follow the roadmap of a typical hero as such roadmaps no longer exist. 
Now Ziz, on the other hand, died from a heart attack, thus becoming a symbol of someone who died for something, at the age where no one needs to die for anything. Do you see the problem here? Your ancestors have built a place of safety and comfort, and you came up with steroids to somehow make up for the lack of danger. Now that there is no natural danger, an artificial danger is created as a new substitute. Now one might think that my calling bodybuilding a surrogate activity is a form of insult and denigration, which I do not intend as I have my sympathies towards the sport. The surrogate activity is not equivalent to futile activity. It is a surrogate because if you had more basic needs in your life, you probably wouldn't have either time or energy to waste your money and means on an extremely expensive and fashionable sport which is offered by modern day fitness industry. Now you might think, hey how it is a form of self-forgetfulness as one goes to the gym and concentrates on his body and muscles and tries to build himself. Well that's the point here. Visualizing yourself as a segmented agglomeration of muscle groups that have to be treated in isolation as if they were a single organism is a form of self-forgetfulness. We don't have a John day or Jessica day, we have leg days and bicep days and chest days. Modernity is a form of extreme specialization and liquefaction of connections between things. Modernity is a form of division in every aspect of being, starting from the economy with Fordism and division of labor with scientific hyperspecialization specialization of studies, up to the political independence of institutions from one another, and what's most important, the atomization of people into individual semi-isolated cells. Thus Peter Sloterdijk's analogy of foam, which describes the essence of modern society as a semi-accessible little bubbles which are co-isolated and do not share one overarching monosphere. This has to do with Thomas Hobbes' new conception of society as being composed of individual blocks as opposed to a nexus of interconnections, evident in the illustration of Leviathan. Thus John Locke's new social contract, where the reasons for people being interdependent or interresponsible are merely reduced to the concept of judicial security, and the famous saying that there is no society but rather just individuals. And if we go further, not only we're separated from each other, but our sense of self as a whole is compromised. Not only your body is now a conglomeration of segmented muscle groups which doesn't yield the whole, but our psyches too are also stratified, unable to yield the unified sense of self. That's why I generally prefer calisthenics to be honest, which gives you a sense of the whole body. Now this asking for suffering and pain is not just a form of masculine crisis, it is also a crisis of femininity. Lots of girls are also asking for pain and suffering, so that their lives too get the share of meaning and purpose. For example, do you remember the absolute romanticization and aestheticization of Effie from the TV show Skins, who becomes suicidal and pathologically depressed, or Bella from the Twilight series, especially when she experiences a transformation, becoming weak and unhealthy? I remember girls being obsessed with it and the way they wanted to emulate this condition of suffering, blackened eyes and pain, which meant something for them. Suffering that had its reasons and purpose or at least could simulate it in a world where people don't have to struggle anymore with facing basic physical challenges. Now surely there is a gender difference here obviously, where male crisis is asking for an active form of pain and suffering and female crisis for more passive pain of the inner world, however they share the commonality of aestheticization that I want to stress here. Of course this is a gross overgeneralization, however still evident and noticeable one. Now let's finally address the three aforementioned problems with the masculinity part. First, as I said, it is overly aesthetical, which in this case points to the lack of substantiveness in inner reality. The existence of hyperreal, as Jean Baudrillard terms it, is a form of an artificial substitution, in this case, a simulacrum, if you will, a phenomenon where the map comes first and reality follows, rather than vice versa, like a Disneyland, you first had a map of it and then the actual one followed. Same with this overly aesthetical conception of masculinity. These people, I mean fitness representatives, do not possess the body type that you would generally get from actual hardship and misery coming from the mother nature, rather this body type is a product of an artificially simulated hardship. Thus you have a map that comes first with specific machines and pictures of bodybuilders about those equipments, and then you get the reality. Now the problem again is lack of insights, the lack of entrails if you will, 
What would remain if you trimmed down muscles and the emotional intensity from the masculinity part of the video? Now, listen to Patrick Bateman for a second. There is an idea of Patrick Bateman, some kind of abstraction, but there is no real me, only an entity, something illusory. And though I can hide my cold gaze and you can shake my hand and feel flesh gripping you, and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable, I simply am not there. So continuing the ethos of Patrick who asks the question, who is Patrick Bateman, I want to ask another question, namely what is masculinity in the age of modernity? And here we come to the major reasons why modern day masculinity operates within the paradigm of modernity. Namely, because it is a veneration of means and instruments without an end goal that transcends personal gratification, which is modernity par excellence. You don't just assume that discipline, healthy food habits, waking up early, working out, getting a job and other forms of activities cherished in this masculine segment of social media are inherently valuable and worthy in and of themselves. And that's why you are operating within the box of modernity, because all of those things that this video cherish are also done by Patrick Bateman, who is a psychopath and a murderer. He wakes up, he exercises, he doesn't eat junk food, and he has money, suits and everything. But see the point? All of those things are not valuable in and of themselves. They are means and instrument that has to serve something objectively good, something that transcends personal gratification, especially if you are someone who opposes modernity and embraces an archaic sense of chivalry. The very mistake that the masculine world makes is the assumption that a healthy lifestyle makes you a good person and that technology and instruments can bear value and meaning. All of these things such as exercise and diet and discipline can be adopted by a bad person and can be directed to evil goals and thus the Machiavellian paradigm of modernity where means and instruments have become virtues replacing divine ends. The very fact that these people have the nerve to put Patrick Bateman and Greek sculptures in the same video shows the very essence of modernity, namely its semiotic free play. Every signifier lost touch with their signifies. Who knows what Greek sculptures are supposed to symbolize when they appear alongside Ronnie Coleman and Patrick Bateman. This pathological confusion with meanings is flesh and blood of modernity. Now hear me out, Greek sculptures and Greek sense of aesthetics and physical strength has absolutely nothing to do with the modern fitness industry. As a matter of fact, these two are diametrically opposed to each other. Well, first and foremost, Greek sense of physical strength operates within the metaphysical system that is founded on the principle of telos, an end goal to which everyone strives. And what's most important, in moderation, which is the highest virtue after the wisdom for Greek philosophers. The very moderation that is lacking in these videos is somehow too muchness is understood as inherently valuable, which makes sense as Oswald Spengler takes striving towards infinity to be the prime symbol of the Western culture. Thus, neither Ronnie Coleman or any other bodybuilder has any categorical relatedness to the Greek body, which is about balance and moderation. Now, the very too muchness of consuming junk food, for example, is substituted by the too muchness and obsession with one's looks, which is everything but masculine. Why? Because if masculinity means something, then it should be an ability to master one's instincts and impulses, which would never result in a condition like bigorexia, for example. In Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, where he lays out the principles of common goals to which people should strive, the end goal is presented as being a good citizen. And being a good citizen is a form of good that is communal and in essence transcends personal gratification. The end goal of modern fitness, on the other hand, in most cases is a fascination with oneself in the mirror. The word that Aristotle uses to denote the common end goal is hen agathos, which means the highest good, bravery and nobility. Thus every means and ways of bettering yourself ultimately serves the goal of the common good. This is a society where an indivisible atomized individual with a hoodie that blocks out the environment around him doesn't exist. If we look at Xenophon's memorabilia where Socrates advises Epigenes to pursue a healthy and strong body, we see that private individual is understood as idioticus, someone who doesn't participate in public affairs. Here, private individual is less likely to have a strong body. However, what's most important is that for Socrates, strong and athletic body is not valuable in and of itself, rather it acquires its value out of its practical utility in times of hardship. Thus, the sculptures of ancient Greece 
gain their value from what they symbolize. Beautiful body is thought to be a product of valor, good citizenship and virtue. Thus Patrick Bateman's chiseled looks are ontologically empty, as it is self-referential. A good body for the sake of good body. The only thing that modern muscular physics signifies is itself and nothing else, which was never the case in the metaphysical period of cultural existence. The point thus that I want to get across is that suffering in and of itself, hardship in and of itself, is not inherently valuable when you don't have an ultimate goal. Therefore, this conception of masculinity is in no way anti-modern, but rather a consumerist, fetishist form of self-gratification, which you are absolutely entitled to and have the right to pursue. But note that this is modernity in its very essence. Now, in the Old Testament, you have the story of Moses, with the guidance of God, rescuing the people of Israel from Egyptian slavery, so that they could get to the Promised Land. Now, what happened was that these people were put to hardship, suffering and torment for 40 years straight, traveling in desert. Not because Moses or God, who is described as Almighty, couldn't have made it easier, but rather because these people had to endure the necessary hardship so that they could evolve into a single superorganism with one goal in mind that would, in essence, transcend someone's personal gratification. Now, just think about it for a moment. You're reading an ancient text. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or not in this case. And you see that people of Israel are put into a very harsh environment and have to follow extremely strict laws where you can be put to death if you are working on the day of Sabbath. And then, after all these years, nothing follows. Turns out that, you know, that's it. Hardship and suffering and physical torment are good and valuable, and that's the end of the story. Well, that would be odd to say the least, right? The common goal is generally something that ascribes sense and purpose and structure to every endeavor that one is invested in. So to get to the end of the video, the response of the warrior archetype of Travis from Taxi Driver, for example, and from people who are fascinated or who are creating this content cannot function as an antidote to what is understood as modernity. You don't neutralize a virus, let's say, by introducing another one. And yes, instruments and means without ends and purpose is a form of a virus. The goal of having a good physique or being strong, having money or being disciplined seems like goals and purposes just because you are blinded by modernity and just because you are thinking with the principles of modernity. Never in the history of humankind strength was understood as a value in and of itself. Sure, now you can cherry pick verses or old sayings about a healthy body from ancient prophets and authors, but that would be a case of blindness to the whole, which is very much what characterizes modernity. All the values of strength and valor from the samurais in Japan and the Bushido code laid out in Hagakure up to the Arthurian romances and values of chivalry are a part and parcel of a systematic metaphysical outlook that no longer exists. Thus, to summarize the problems that I laid out, it would look like this. The response of masculinity is overly emotional and lacks the solidity and moderation that it tries to venerate by displaying Greek sculptures. Thus, its emotionality points to its revolutionary ethos, which is in a sense philosophically mature, as quick solutions generally never address the problem in its entirety, but rather serves as a superficial substitute, failing to produce a paradigm shift. Then it is self-referential, with empty signifiers, creating a loop where only superficial signifiers are amplified to infinity. The same way modernity is self-referential, illustrated by the following formula. Progress for the sake of progress. This understanding of masculinity continues this trend. Workout for the sake of workout, and discipline for the sake of discipline. Thus, this leads me to the ultimate problem with the ethos of this reaction, namely that it is an unended sentence. If you are someone who operates outside the paradigm of modernity, then you naturally expect the statement discipline, diet, workout and masculinity is good and desirable so that and there is no so that. As in modernity means are understood to be valuable in and of themselves without a transcendent end goal. 
Further, it is overly aesthetical, which means that it is outwardly related rather than inwardly related. This suggests that it is not aimed at solving problems paradigmatically, but rather expresses its attitude with images rather than words, which is noteworthy, as in the modernity part of the videos you generally get someone who is misguided about the value of exercise and expresses opinion by making a statement, which is followed by a silencing answer through images rather than a counter-argument, for example. But the lack of words point to the lack of structure and Apollinean form, which is evidenced by careless choosing of what are to be displayed. You can't make a statement that has a bold meaning by displaying Ronnie Coleman, Greek sculptures and Patrick Bateman in the same context, as there is no philosophical relatedness between them. And lastly, it is also a surrogate activity, which aims at filling the void of the meaning crisis, which happens by accepting a techno-capitalist, consumerist, ready-to-hand roadmap of modern fitness lifestyle. Now, for the ending, I will give you my personal disposition. I take a healthy lifestyle and exercise to be a pillar of one's well-being, not just physical, but mental well-being. However, there is a problem that needs to be addressed. All of these things have to serve something, something which is good, something that transcends personal gratification. And if you disagree with me on this point and think that everyone has their own goals and their understandings of masculinity, then what's your problem with modernity at all? After all, maybe you are not that opposed to it. The very fact that there is no common good is the gist of modernity. Thus, there needs to be a more structured and content-rich formulation of one's dissatisfaction with anything you are trying to oppose. Now, I hope that the intentions behind my message are crystal clear and are not directed to certain individuals or groups of people per se, but rather have to do with the ideas and worldviews which are hosted by individuals or groups of people. After all, when means and technology were disconnected or unplugged from the central binding principle of common goals, they became self-autonomous competing ideas so that something could at least temporarily fill the existential vacancy of modern society. Now, as always, I want to send special thanks to my Patreons who are supplying me with the motivation and necessary resources to make these videos. The fact that people find this so interesting to support this channel in this way is very important to me. I also want to thank people who would love to do it but are unable to. Also, you can express your opinion in the comment section about how you perceive this form of polarization affecting modern society and whether you think that it will yield something positive or not.